Stanford University. today by playing this piece clap music and then we'll spend some time dissecting it um, getting you guys uh, teaching it to you playing it all together in some way um, letting you guys ask questions about it and then we brought another piece to maybe um, in the hour with uh, so we'll give you our version a four-man version of clap music
hasn't heard that piece before? I know maybe some of you guys have. Okay, great, 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 great. So that piece, uh, a little bit of the, what I know of the history of that piece and what we know, I'm not sure. Um, I'll say, I'll say beforehand, Steve Reich for us as percussionists, especially you know, coming out of this kind of contemporary experimental tradition, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of lore that goes with, with Steve Reich. Um, before we had a chance to work with Steve Reich, you would just kind of hear stories, and it was like, um, you know, like you knew all the guys that were originally playing his music, you know, we were, it was like one generation before us, or you know, that these folks that were doing it for the first time, and so you knew these names. I remember the first time, um, I met one of the guys, Bob Becker, who played in, in his original group. I remember feeling like I grew up collecting baseball cards, and I remember feeling like that. I was like, "Oh my gosh! Like this is like you know Bob Becker working with Steve Wright. You know, it's like such a thing." So I'm realizing the more we work with with Steve, and the more we learn actually what happened. Some of the stories I think I learned when I was like in college are a little bit lower. So I'm just putting that out there because this is what I understand of of copy music. Um, it was written in the early '70s. Um, and this was at a time, I think, when he was touring, you know, he was a, um, he was a musician that had his own band. You know, it was, it was a time when um, he was a classical composer that was writing music that wasn't so accepted by um, the kind of classical tradition at the time. You know, the classical tradition at the time was a more, um, living in a more crunchy time, a more kind of modernist European style. Um, and he was saying, that's not the world I'm living in. Um, and he wasn't so accepted in that, in that realm. So he was putting, basically putting a band together to play his music. Um, much like many styles of music, you know, that's not that um, strange, but in classical music that doesn't normally happen. Normally you're writing, you know, for the San Francisco Orchestra or for the you know, New York Philharmonic or for the- There wasn't like the Stravinsky Ensemble. Ensemble. Yeah, exactly, there wasn't, yeah, the Beethoven Ensemble or the Stravinsky Ensemble, those things didn't happen. So he was like, this is the Steve Reich Ensemble. And they would tour, and they would they would be touring with you know three marimbas and three glockenspiels and a bunch of bongos, and they would bring their own PA system because classical music didn't wasn't amplified at that time, and they'd bring all their own microphones, and they'd be in Europe, and they'd have you know these big trucks, and they were moving around all their stuff, and they were like, I don't want to have to move around all my stuff all the time, you know, and so he decided to write a piece that was very portable, um, and I think at that time he was like, um, from what I understand, they were touring Spain and Portugal. And they were like, um, you know, Steve said, I want, I want to write a piece that's more, it's more portable. I don't have to bring all this gear along, you know. Um, and they were watching flamenco. They saw they were they were kind of you know drinking after a concert, watching a flamenco concert. It's like, oh my gosh, like this is amazing. What the flamenco dancers, um, the kind of clapping style, you know, um, that was kind of just so like ingrained in that music. Um, and so he he wrote music. I think it was inspired by that kind of a flamenco rhythms and sounds of, of clapping music and took that and kind of made it um, uh, its own piece. And the music that he was playing at that time, um, from what I understand, I think they were on a, a tour playing a piece called Drumming. Um, we're gonna play the first part of that on, on Saturday night and for, for our group specifically and for, for a percussion group, um, that piece is just, it's a, it's a monster. It's, um, you know, this is probably not the right thing to say, but it's kind of like our Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. You know, it's like it's just huge work, it's in four movements, it relies on percussionists to be the thing, and that just didn't happen in classical music at that time. Um, and so this piece that he was touring relied on phasing. And that concept, um, just to go over it very, very briefly, is the idea that you're gonna play, two people are gonna play the same rhythm at the same time, and you're slowly gonna go to the next, kind of the next rhythm. So if, if me and Adam were to, to clap this rhythm, To slowly go, I was to slowly speed up. If I slowly speed up to try to get to the next pattern, we've never done that before. That, uh, that would be the idea of phasing. You would start exactly the same, and you would slowly, one person would slowly speed up until you got to kind of the next place. Um, and that's, the music he was writing at that time was phase-based music. And originally, I, I just learned this, that he wanted clapping music um, to be done as a kind of phase piece. Um, and then they started to, him and I think it was Russell Hardenberger was in his group, 
another baseball card I had when I was in college. And uh, you know, these guys played this piece, and originally they would try, like you know, when they were on tour, they would try to do it as a as a phase piece. Um, and slowly he was like, well, maybe maybe we don't have to phase from one rhythm to the next. Maybe we don't have to slowly get faster. What if we just play that rhythm together, and then at a set time when we decide after 12 repetitions, let's go to the next one. And that was like the first time Steve Rice had done that in his music. Um, and so this piece is almost kind of like the first, um, I, I, I want to say etude, and that makes it feel like it's not such a cool piece, because when you hear the word etude, you know it's like a study. But it's kind of like a study in um, a canon on this rhythm. And this is a rhythm that, that uh, Steve used you know, for the next, I want to say for the next you know, 10 years, but really he used often in his music um, this, this rhythm. And he used this idea as well to just kind of um, jump to different, um, to different spots in the rhythm, playing two rhythms together starting in different spots. Um, so we're going to teach you guys how to do those, those couple things over the next uh, you know, 30 minutes or so. Um, the idea, do you guys know the term, um, any of these three terms? Fugue, canon, or around? Yeah, maybe all three of those terms. They're kind of sort of uh, all mean the same thing in, in some way. A canon is the way we would talk about this idea. That when you when two people are doing the two the same thing, starting in different places, um, around is the way probably all of us have done it. With a, a you know row 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 your boat. If you sing it in a round, um, you know you would start singing and it won't make you do it. And then you would come in a little bit later and you would come in a little bit later, all singing that melody. That's kind of, that's a, a, a round. And so what what we did in clapping music is take that rhythm and do it in a canon. And we did it in all the different permutations. All right. Let's jump to one more thing before we all get you guys all clapping, because um, another thing that uh, is kind of core to a lot of Steve Reich's music, um, a lot of the music that, that we, we're going to play on this Saturday concert, um, whether it's music for mallet instruments, um, a new piece that, that we're doing the US premiere of, um, whether it's uh, a piece we play on bongos drumming I was telling you guys about, whether it's um, music for pieces of wood that we're going to play a little for you. All, a lot of this music deals with 12, groupings of 12. Um, and uh, again, I'm going to talk from what I know, know about lore. I feel like with the, with the audio and video, I want to make sure that I'm, this is, you know what my knowledge of this lore is. Um, he got infatuated with 12, and you, you guys help me out here and correct me. Um, when he went to, um, to Ghana to study for uh, either a summer or I think maybe about a, a month, I think it was a, a, a short period of time, but he was hugely impressed by the music he, he was studying. And um, this, is, this is a time, and it's hard for, I think, the, the, the generation of musicians we're coming from, it's hard to imagine this time when you didn't know what African music sounded like, or you didn't know what gamelan sounded Your like. Your only access to it was if you happened to find one of those early Nunsuch records in a bin somewhere, <laughs> you know, which yeah. didn't have YouTube. Yeah, right, you couldn't just like go check it out, you know, or go to the, um, you know, go to the library. I'm sure you could go to the music library at Stanford and hear music from all of these places, you know, um, where you didn't know what a Brazilian samba sounded like, you know. That was the history of, you know, a lot of um, music for a long time. And I think in the, um, you know, over the 20th century, that started to, to break down more and more until it was like, wow, we can learn about music really quickly. Steve Reich was on, on the side of that where it was like, you know, starting to hear these kind of bits of this wonderful music coming out of West Africa. Man, I'm going to go learn about that. Um, and for us, that's just so huge because, you know, we, we as a group and as, as you know, performers come out of a, a classical tradition. We study classical music. Um, we're also of the, the age where drummers never started studying classical music. That, that wasn't the, um, I mean, maybe, maybe that's not true, but for, for myself, when I first started playing the drums, it wasn't like, I want to be a classical percussionist. You know, that's not, it, it was the, I want to bang on my mom's pots and pans in the kitchen. You know, that was like the end. You know, and then it was, I want to learn Led Zeppelin tunes, you know. So, and then it was like, I want to learn to play jazz. It was like a much more um, kind of a roundabout way to classical music. Um, but drummers don't have this kind of history of uh, being up front in classical music and being kind of like, um, you know, carrying the bulk of the weight. You know, you think of, you know, if I say classical musical instrument, you know, people, if we were on that game show, what's that game, Family Feud? <laughs> you know, it would be like, you know, violin, piano, you know, clarinet, you know, like, 
percussion wouldn't come up for a long, long time. But every other country in the world besides Western Europe, actually including the United States, with like traditional folk music, is kind of based on percussion. You know, like Native American music is super drum drum and bass. You know, um, music of South America and Central America is super percussion heavy. Music of Africa is all about drums. Music of uh, Southeast Asia is all about drums. Music of India is all, you know, it's all about drums. You know, and on and on and on. Um, so he, I think, got back from Africa and was like, oh man, like, it's okay to make music about drums. You know, like this is really, um, you know, the hierarchy doesn't have to be melody, harmony, rhythm. You know, it can be like rhythm, harmony. Yeah, rhythm, 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 rhythm melody. Yeah, exactly, you know, that's okay to do. Um, so he got back from Africa learning that and learning that lots of, lots of traditional African music, um, not all by any stretch of the imagination, but much of it um, deals in 12, deals in these groupings of 12. Um, so let's take this rhythm and show you how that happens. One, one of the cool things um, about 12, I'll say, because I, I imagine if anybody uh, listened to music today, who's listened to music today at all? <laughs> I like the raising hands thing. We've been doing a lot of. I'm sorry. We've just like a, we've been doing a lot of like little kids classes. Like, who's listening to music today? You guys aren't little kids. Any music? Who's heard a piece of music today? What about in a store? Who's heard a piece of music that's been on the anything? I bet any music. The last piece of music you heard, I bet you, was in a, a four four time signature. It's like most like pop music and much classical music deals in four. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the music that I listen to when I'm at home. Um, is in, is in four. And the drum beats that I learned to play with those Led Zeppelin tunes are not always, but a lot of times in four, you know. Gah, gah, gah. That's what you know, most of the music, most of the amazing music that comes out of, you know, a, the American pop music is that. And there's not that many ways that you can hear that, that you can uh, subdivide that music. Um, the drummer playing that music is kind of telling you, this is where the beat is. The down beat's here. Yes, it's, 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 uh, it's pop music. Yeah, totally. No, I mean, not that as a criticism, no. but to say that the point of it is to be something that is, is you can grasp uh, really quickly. I was gonna say dance music, but that doesn't actually hold up because this African music we're talking about is also dance music. Um, it's just a lot more. It's a lot more fluid. Um, and so when you're dealing with these groups of twelve, the dancers had lots of choices on how to on how to move, on how to subdivide. Um, you can subdivide a group of 12 into, you know, it seems like on the outside only a few different, you can only subdivide 12 in a few more ways than eight. But actually, musically, that's a lot more choices. Eight, you know, you can do groups of four, groups of two, you know, two, four, four, two, those are kind of your groupings. With 12, you, you can do two groups of six, uh, three groups of four, four groups of three, or six groups of two. You know, you have that many kind of more, more choices on how you're gonna subdivide this music. Um, so let's all get you guys clapping. Without playing the rhythm of clapping music, let's just, let's take that rhythm. Maybe you guys can hold down that rhythm. And we're gonna, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you how we can subdivide this rhythm in a few different ways, all right? Um, so we'll start off, you know, following me. We'll start off a little slowly and we'll, we'll pick it up.
as an audience, as listeners, you have all those choices. And what Steve Reich likes to try to do with a lot of this music is make it ambiguous as to where these pulses have to be so that when you're listening to the music, you get to make that choice for yourself. And then sometimes he likes to say, nope, here it is. You know, and maybe snap you out of it in some way. Um, lots of his music is pretty long. Um, part of the great thing about this, this music oftentimes, with this piece drumming, like I said, if it's 70 minutes dealing in the same kind of rhythmic place, you know, maybe, you know, even if we were to listen to it, maybe, you know, 10 minutes in, you're following, like, where all the downbeats are, and by the time you're, like, 30 minutes in and you're just enjoying it, you forget where everything is, and so even as somebody who knows that music really well, you get to kind of make these choices for yourself. So if, if we were to, to take one of these rhythms and play it in canon, let, let's try to play it without showing a downbeat, like, you pop yeah. it, pop music. It would also be cool to do the same project thing. Three, four, three. Yeah, totally, yeah, yeah. So let's try that right now. You guys offset it. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So if you just have this rhythm going, you're not really checking out where everything is. Where do you guys think the beginning is? Where do you think the down is? Everybody close your eyes and bob your head to the music. Because you know I, you're not supposed to bob your head at a classical music concert, so nobody bobs their head. You know, that's like the, it's the worst thing. Don't ever bob your head at our concert. It would just like totally offend us. You know, I'm just joking. Um, but so you know, it actually works because you don't, you can't tell what's going on. You know, it's it's everywhere. So let, let's take this and do the same thing that that Adam suggested. But uh, clap these different subdivisions based on their their can. We'll show you. Let's try it. Yeah, follow. You can follow us. Yeah. So that's all the different permutations, but that still assumed that there was one common meter and downbeat. Um, and this is the premise of, um, you know, rhythmically what is happening in a lot of Western music. And obviously, you can always find great exceptions with great composers, or whatever. But by and large, the concept that there could be one person up in front of a hundred people dictating a common downbeat and a common pulse sort of gives you the idea. Okay, whatever's going on melodically and har uh, harmonically. There is always sort of a ground base rhythmically that everybody can follow. But once you start um, opening up the idea that the downbeats could be ambiguous and could be happening, anybody's downbeat could be in a different part of the bar while the rhythm and the groove is still going on, that's actually impossible music to conduct because everybody's bass or downbeat is as good as everybody else's. And I think this was one of the really revelatory things that he found and was inspired by 
in West African music is this idea that we can blow the idea of the common pulse or the common downbeat um, out the window. And as long as we get a groove going that everybody can lock into, we could be placed all over, we could be all over the place within that rhythm and still make the music happen. Yeah, I know as like uh, Western educated classical musicians, I have this idea of this downbeat that's just like, you know, sacred downbeat. Sacred downbeat. Yeah, and, and I went to Bali to study, and I remember I would learn from this, you know, this guy would come and also just learning music in Bali, like, oh my gosh, it's amazing, but it's horrible. I mean, it's just like, you know, he plays this like, you know, minute long thing for you and then does it again. And like, you know, the first time he plays it for you, you get like the first two notes and then you have to like wait for him to be done playing. And then you're like, you get the next three and then you're like, it's just like trial by fire. You know, it's like you're going and he teaches me this whole thing. And the whole thing I'm counting, you know, my downbeats are like, you know, one, whatever, whatever. And for him, he, he just decided to count it, he, he, he counts, it was a, a phrase that went one through 16. And for him, 16 was, was the downbeat. You know, it was just the gong, was, was the end of the phrase, was the gong. And for me, it was the beginning. And so it took me forever, it was like totally, I couldn't get my head around the idea that when somebody says one, that doesn't mean like, you know, the thing. It was much more ambiguous, I think, in Indian most Indian music places. is like that. It yeah. has, has a lot of additive rhythm, where instead of this one framework of a few beats, I mean, if you think of a cycle coming back every two, three, or four beats, or even, whoa, six or something, like Indian music, sometimes it goes on for 35 yeah, beats yeah, yeah. in one. You and know? other cultures, like I spent a month in Trinidad a couple years ago, and music in Trinidad, there's a drum set player, and there's a, there's a capo player, and it's like the, the beat is obvious, but the way, just the way they approach learning music was totally, I mean, it, it wasn't like that was your reference point. The guy who's teaching music, he was just like, you know, pounding on a table while he's counting out rhythms to me and, and telling me notes and he's teaching it all by rope. So it's like, okay, great. I learned this rhythm, bum bug it dum bug it da or whatever, and he teaches me a 12 minute tune, then I show up and I, it's not fitting together. I'm like, what the hell is going on? And I realized everything he taught me was supposed to be shifted over a 16th note. So I had learned it instead of one and a two and it, it was one e, a two, da, 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 you know, whatever for twelve more minutes. <laughs> wow. You like, learned the whole piece oh shifted over well, a sixteen. And for him and he's like, well the rhythm it's just easier to feel if I start my downbeat here and then play everything on the downbeat. <laughs> and everybody in the band is doing that. And then the drum set player just sort of just like holds the whole thing together. And it sounds like the feel is so much different and, and it is really cool. But you know, as a you know, like I said, as a musician growing up, no one ever told me that that was even possible. And it has its pluses and minuses, obviously, when you're learning music, it's kind of troublesome if you don't tell somebody that it's not on the downbeat. But but it but but it was a really cool approach and I think allowed you to allowed me to hear things in a totally different manner. And there is a sense in which, if you look at, com inside of Western music, if you look at a composer like Stravinsky in the last moment of the Rite of Spring, if anybody's a fan of that piece, when you watch an orchestra play that piece, you watch the conductor conduct it, and actually he's doing a little bit of what we're talking about in that piece, and that a lot of that piece, is, the downbeat is silent, and then weird stuff comes after. Da, 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 da. So there's, um, you know, he, I think, was blowing the door open a little bit on this idea of, oh, we're all in the same place, because when you watch it, it's not what you're hearing, and you're like, wow. So this is really am rhythmically ambiguous music. And I think that over the last hundred years, the idea that different cultures have been influencing um, what has happened in Western music with rhythmic stuff, I think this is something we really latch on to. I wish there would be an orchestra that could, like, just set aside in the season and just teach, like, Beethoven 5 by rote, not let anybody have mm -hmm. music, and, just, and no conductor. I mean, it's like, it's always funny to be like, you talk about the conductor, like, the first thing he does is there's silence. Oh, like, there's right. nothing, right? But and then da, da, da. everybody comes in. Does but everybody you, know that that's what it is, like, the beginning of Beethoven 5, right? Ba, da, da, da. Ba, da, da, da. So feel, you watch the conductor. Ba, da, 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 da. The it's feel of your, your experience as a, as a, as a listener mm -hmm. and, an, and a watcher, someone who's seeing this, would, I, my hunch would be, it would be completely different. Even if you knew the piece, you would start to hear things in a totally different manner dun, 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 dun. Than if someone was up there beating you through it. So, well, let's jump into this real yes. um, Let's Actually, let's, let's just, uh, just listen and play it back to us. Start there. It's always, we, have, we have time, so let's start there. It's always the best place to start. If you can't tell, if you, if you didn't, didn't catch on, there's this one rhythm you have to learn, and then we're going to do it for a long time. <laughs> so uh, this is what it is.
Some of us are going to be the movers, and some of us are going to be the shakers. Now, some of us are going to be the rock. That's what we call it when we play Steve's music. He doesn't call it that, I don't think, but we call it the rock, which means you're going to stay steady, and the other folks are going to, going to start shifting. Um, let's say this. Let's say, is there anybody, because is there anybody that would not like to learn how to shift right now? Okay, great. We'll be, we'll be the rocks up here. Um, or three of us will be the rocks, and one of us will, will help guide you guys through. Because it's, um, it's in, in, St in Steve's music, when you're first learning it, everybody wants to be the movers, but it turns out that the rock is actually probably the most important part. Oh, but, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, I see. <laughs> you get the spotlight on stage if you're the rock. No, but I think for us learning it together right now, it'll be, it'll be fun for you guys to, to, to... Oh, so you'll need everybody in shifting against Yeah, us. against you guys. Yeah, you guys will be strong. Great. Yeah, it's great. Um, if anybody, I wrote the rhythm up on the board with, um, that may not necessarily be, those, well, first of all, those of you guys who don't read music, you probably could care less. And those of you who do read music, you don't necessarily see what one, need to see what it's like right now. But if you did want to, if anybody does read music and wanted to just write down the rhythm um, so that you could kind of take it and, and learn it with your you know, friend or figure it out after this time, um, we, we threw it up on the board. The, that's the group of three, two, one, two. Um, and Adam had a good point because oftentimes we tell people, like, we're playing groups of 12. It's three, two, one, two. And then you add up those numbers and it doesn't equal 12. Um, it's because you have these little, uh, these rests in between. So there's 12, there's 12 possible places to put a note, and we're putting them in three, two, one, and two of them. Um, okay, so the way we're going to do it, and I also have to say this too, uh, mainly because, you know, video and audio. <laughs> you know, I mean, we didn't even read the waiver we signed. It's probably going to show up on YouTube tomorrow, and that can be scary. You know, we have some, anybody wants Funny a good stuff time, like yeah, yeah, you can find some stuff if you go back on YouTube. It gets scary. Um, we're, we're going to learn this as a group the way that um, I think probably all of us, or I know the way um, I learned it when I was in college, which was more just like, you know, in college you heard about, man, there's this composer, Steve Rice, who wrote all this cool music. One of them is just for two clappers. Oh, awesome. This is how it works. And you never really saw it on paper, and you just learned how to do it. And so I kind of learned how to do it the way I'm going to teach you guys. Um, the way it's actually performed um, is you use a slightly different technique to get to the same outcome. But I think this, this technique is going to be good for us to use right now. And the technique is going to be this. Um, so if you guys can picture it, like I said, there's 12 different ways to put this rhythm together. And we're going to start off, you know, if this is that one rhythm and this is another, we're going to start off right on top of each other. And all of us, as the movers, are going to move our rhythm so it starts one eighth note earlier. So if both groups are playing this exactly the same, right? When we move, we're going to start our three just before this. You know, we're going to move it just before everybody else, all right? So that the same, the same kind of grid is happening, we're just going to move it slightly, slightly ahead. Um, and so we're going to be kind of filling in their hole. And so for anybody who's, who's thinking of this musically and not just uh, following the leader, um, the way we're going to do it as a group is that when we change, 
we're just going to leave out this rest and jump to the jump to the three again. Just put that out there for anybody who wants to get around it cerebrally. If you want to get around it just viscerally, that's a little more fun, and you can just follow me. Um, let's try. Let's do this. Let's try just a couple rhythms, um, so you can see what this is about, and then uh, we can. Before we, I think we want to do a run through of this whole piece to to end today. But let's do just a couple of them to see how we're doing as a moving group and how these guys are doing as a rock group and we can talk about this, the process. Yeah, so let's start off slowly and we'll, we'll try the first four patterns. Um, and you can follow me. You're always gonna be clapping the three, two, one, two. We're just gonna start the three in a different place. All right, is anybody kind of, everybody kind of sort of on, on the page? If, uh, if we try this and it uh, fails miserably, you know, we'll talk about it. But I think uh, going for it is always good. All right, so let's start all together. One, two, ready, go. so that when you do shift, you can stay on your shifted path versus hearing the textures around you and knowing because you're surrounded by people playing other rhythms that you're actually doing something right. Like, how do you deal with that shift of individual yeah. to collective and back again? We may all have slightly different ways of going about it because when you're learning this music, you, I think, find your own way through it because there is sort of the theoretical, okay, I understand how it's all lining up, working together. There is also the practical of whatever I have to do to keep my head in the right place while everything is going on. I'll say for myself, when I play the offset part, I really, it's like I've memorized 12 different rhythms and I just go, okay, now it's time to go to the second rhythm and the third rhythm because that way I'm sure that I'm not going to end up spacing out, well, not sure, but hopefully not going to space out to, which was I on the three before the downbeat or whatever? It's just like the next beat I've memorized is this one and then this one. The truth is, yes, they all are the same beat. When you look at the score on the page, the way he notates it is to actually notate each different rhythm. And so the thing that we're doing by starting you guys earlier is to show you what the process is. But he, yeah, he actually notates in the score what ends up looking like a different rhythm. Now this is the same rhythm, right? Because it's one, two, three, one, two, one, one, two. But you know, when you write, when he writes it all on the page and you learn it, if you just kind of look at and memorize each one of these, that's one way to get to the same thing. So when we performed it for you guys, 
when the people switched, they didn't, they didn't cut the notes short and go, that was kind of a way to show you guys that that's exactly what's, what's happening. So does yeah. that answer your question? About yes, that's the, the, the way I, I uh, that was the like, oh, I learned about the Steve Reich piece. And when I first did it with my friend, it was like, oh, that's how we could do it. Um, but to, to answer your question, Jenny, I think this is, I, I thought about this last night. Somebody asked us this, the same question or, or a, a similar question. And, and this music, Steve Reich's music for, for us as a group and like I said, just for, you know, contemporary experimental percussion tradition, it, he's like, one of the three dudes, you know? I mean, this is like the guy. And so this is music that we, you know, some of this music we learned in 1999, and we still play it now. And every time we come back to it, um, we find out something new about it. So I think for, for me, it's been a process of, I remember when I first started playing uh, Steve Reich's music, I was like, this is the most fun music ever. And I remember having a great time playing it. And then I remember going through a thing saying like, oh man, if I'm having too good a time, like, I think it means I'm listening too much to what I'm doing, and I need to just kind of zone in and make sure I'm doing my job so that you guys can have a good time. And then the next time I came back to it, it was like, oh man, all of a sudden now I can hear myself and hear the whole and have a good time while you guys are having a good time. And then the next time I came back to it, it was like, oh man. Like, I, you know, it's like every time you revisited this music, you kind of found a different layer to it. Um, and I think it is much more about, um, I think Adam's answer was, right on in that I think uh, we think about you guys a lot, meaning the audience, and we want you guys to be able to hear as many different things as possible, which means we can't, we Place have to, yeah, in all sort of places we have to be able to hear it in as many ways as possible too, and then decide as a group, we're going to hear it this one way that's going to be as even as possible so that you guys can bob your head 8,000 different ways. You know, if we were going like this, you know, you guys would all be bobbing your heads like that too, because we'd be saying, do this with us, kind of thing, you know? But if we do it completely even and kind of really get into this group sound, we can let you guys say, oh man, like, you know, this is crazy. Like two minutes in, you know, I start hearing clapping coming from all these different places and it turns into a different kind of phenomenon. I would say only also that it's no different than playing in any other kind of contrapuntal texture, like playing a Bach fugue or something. Where, you know, if you were to ask a really great pianist, well, when you're doing the well-tempered clavier, like, are you paying attention to the integrity of each individual voice as it's going along? Or are you listening to how the whole thing progresses harmonically? And the answer is yes and yes. Yeah. And that you're somehow learning how to split your brain in order to keep the integrity of both of those at the same time. In this case, the integrity of our individual rhythm is very important. And the integrity of the complex of rhythms that happen is also very important. Yeah, yeah. And the challenge is that as you're, and this is why you can play this music day after day for years, is that you're constantly going over here a little bit to see what it's like over here. Well, what's it like over here? I'm listening to more, my, more to myself now. I'm tuning in more to him now, more to him now. And as you do that over time, you gain this incredibly rich experience of, of listening outwardly and also inwardly. Yeah. Um, I was just going to ask, who are the two other people? But more importantly, can any of you play this um, both parts simultaneously with each hand? Because I assume that you can both you can all hear like the complex rhythms. You say the first one because you know how to do the first one. Now. I know that and, and I'm like, you heard the eleventh <laughs> one before, and there's another easy one, but the rests line up more. But I, I just wondered. If yeah, you know, it was a thing. You know that percussionist uh, Glenn Kachi? He, he's you know this band Wilco, this like amazing drummer with Wilco, um, has started to do some solo percussion stuff as well. And I know I, I like read this article about him a long time ago that said he would warm up every day playing clapping music, you know, in each hand separately. And I was like, man, I want to be able to do that. So like every subway ride I took, I would try to figure him out. But I never, you know, I would always have to get off the subway before I like figure it all out because it's, it's tricky, you know. Um, but it's it's definitely possible to figure out. And I, I've never done it. I think yeah. I don't do a lot of this. No, no, no. Um, just, like I just, you said, just the figure first one. it out. Yeah. yeah, there's a few of them that like, you can get your head around, um, but then it does get tricky. Um, and I don't know what, what these guys, I, for, for, for us, uh, I mentioned Steve Rice is like the dude, and John Cage is the dude. And I think we can agree on that as a group from where we, we come from. Um, both of those composers um, have been just really like, uh, hugely inspirational and just kind of laid this, this crazy foundation for the kind of thing that we do. Um, 
who the third would be, I'm not sure. That's well, there, there's a, the, those yeah, are for us, I think, the two core ten. guys. And then you've got, you got uh, composers like Verez and Xenakis um, and a whole bunch of other people we could name that are also part of that thing. I think with, with Reich and Cage, not only, not only is it, oh, these are two of the big guys for percussion, but we've been in New York for a little while. We've been playing percussion music in New York for a little while. Um, we're really interested in what are voices that are coming out of different American voices that are coming out of the scene around New York and the West Coast and stuff like that. And those two guys not only are inspirational, but they just are, they are also the foundation of those scenes, you know. So I think us as an American group, um, that's a fun thing for us to connect to. So it's not that we're excluding like uh, somebody like Zanakis because he's European or something. It's just like, those two guys are at the at the core, and then there's there's some there's guys like like David Lang. We played at David Lang yeah, and of years ago. We were here, and he sort of is. Uh, it's a, again, I'm generalizing a little bit. He's sort of synthesizing the idea that of Reich is that you can have a work of percussion that can be an entire half of the concert, um, and also taking ideas from Perez and Cage of like using pieces that out of found instruments, you know, things you build, flower cups, you know, flower pots, cups, things like that. He's another. He's a New York guy that we work with all the time. He's a friend of ours that, uh, that's super important to us. Looks like maybe we need to wrap it up. Let's let's see if we can do a quick run through of this. It'll be quick. Yeah, two minutes. We should do it. Yeah, it'll be. It's gonna be quick. This is gonna be like crazy brute force. Ready, go. I'm just joking. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's see if we can do this. You guys, you guys follow me. I won't do the go to the store thing. Either way. No. Okay. One, two, ready, go. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.